see, there is a reason for all things. She keeps me focused when I lose my focus sometimes. And speaking of focus, let us continue with our scripture reading for this morning. It's found in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 8. Now, prior to our particular part of the reading this morning, that is verse chapter 8, verse 27 to 38, we have some, some struggles that Jesus is having and some miracles that he's showing. He's doing what he does. But the Pharisees earlier on demand a sign from Jesus. He cures a blind man and that all in the midst of those things that it just doesn't sink into them. Jesus is, if you will, stirring things up. So we continue with the teaching, the lesson from the Gospel according to Mark, with verse 27 to 38. So Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them to not tell anyone about him. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. May God add his blessing to this, the hearing of his word. Let all of God's people say amen. amen. Apologist, writer, C.S. Lewis wrote in a book called Mere Christianity, and I quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish things that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Well, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, and you can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense 
about his being a great human teacher, he's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. He did not intend to. You and I as human beings, we often find ourselves, I'm afraid, staying in the shadows. And I'm as guilty as anyone. We want to stay away sometimes from, from the light and from the exposure that the light brings. We want to stay hidden because it's a fearful place sometimes to walk bravely into the light, into the presence of God. Old and New Testament alike makes it very clear. It is a a fearful place to be. To have God expose our weaknesses, our inability to see certain things, such as the color of choir ropes. <laughs> Simple things, perhaps. And yet, most often, they are profound things. There is a story of a man who lived in the desert. He would wake up every morning and he would follow his shadow. He would wake up every morning and he would follow his shadow. This continued on for years. He would mind, he would think that he would be protected from the, the heat of the sun by his shadow as long as he followed it. One day, one evening to be exact, he had a dream. And in the dream it was the voice of God who spoke to him. And God's voice said to him, follow the sun. Stop following your shadow. And you will experience life as you've never dreamt it to be. He thought about this dream for a while, but he continued to follow and stay within his own shadow. Still afraid to step out from his comfort of the shadow. One day he mustered up enough courage to break away from his shadow. And he began to see the world and life in a whole different way. Do you live in your shadow? Right now we are watching the shadows and the fears of life grip us with the most recent horrible act of the storms coming off the Atlantic by the name of Florence. Moving into the Carolinas and moving up the East Coast, dumping lots and lots of rain and with it wind. Terrible, terrifying. And I was reading about Florence this past week. I was also reading a, a story of, uh, from social scientists that talk about the survivors of such horrible things such as Florence and the struggles that they have following this. What they've discovered is that what people struggle with most is not the, light, not the loss of, of their homes or their property, the damage and all that. That's not the most damage. What is most damaging is, is internal. They begin to question existence itself. How can I trust the world ever again? How can I trust ever trusting anything in this treacherous, horrible age that we live in? Those are the questions that come up to people. They have the ability to deal with the loss of all of their properties. But the existential questions of existence itself comes up, rises up from them. And I think it's true for many of us, for most of us. I know at times in the past I have struggled to sleep. You know the old question of, of Shakespeare, to sleep perchance to dream. Have you ever been to a place where you didn't want to, to dream? You didn't want to sleep because you might be exposed to something you didn't want to be exposed to? That, that wolf in sheep's clothing waiting to prey on you in your dream state. To bring about all the doubts and questions in your mind, the loss and the struggle that you're dealing with. 
and the howl of laughter from this demonic wolf, if you will, in your dreams. Where is your God now? Where is your God? In the midst of the storm that comes, whether it's Florence or a storm of psychology and, and spiritual struggle, where is your God? Is this howl that comes to us. It is to this place, my sisters and brothers, where we have come today with Jesus. Caesarea Philippi. We need to understand the location, the setting that Mark has chosen to tell his story. Caesarea Philippi was a dark place. It was a place where the people of the day worshipped the god Pan. It was a place represented physically, a cave where there was supposedly an entrance to hell itself right there at Caesarea Philippi. This is where Jesus chose to take his disciples to the very heart of the shadows and the darkness of the world. This is where Jesus chose to take them and to ask them a very simple question. Who do you say that I am? After he posed a question about all the others, what all they say, what do you say? Or who do you say, rather, am I? It's a question. He's not forcing us. He's not begging us to believe. He's asking us, who do you say that I am? In your heart of hearts, deep within you, I think if we are to truly understand who Jesus is, who Christ Jesus is for us, we need to surrender ourselves. The old days of the church, we used to talk about surrendering and, and coming to Jesus, and it still holds true. That has not gone away. We still must surrender our will to God's will. Surrender to the deliverance in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, and I will give you rest. And a surrender of devotion in Matthew 16, If anyone desires to come after me, let them deny themselves and follow me. It is a mindset. It is a retooling, if you will, of how we do things. How we think about life itself. Fear and doubt, the wolf in sheep's clothing that haunts us at nighttime, perhaps. Right now, each and every one of us in this room are wrestling with something. It might be some of the literature that we've been reading lately on, on a way forward, and the meetings coming up in February for the General Conference of the United Methodist Church. It might be in Florence. The storms, family and friends dealing with that on the East Coast. It might be anxiety and stress for the mental health education program coming up on this Thursday evening. Whatever it might be, day to day, there is a battle, there is a fight that we each wrestle with. The great theologian Paul Tillich said, almost every person you meet is fighting a great battle within. Almost every person you meet is fighting a battle within. That's why during the children's time I said it's so important for us to know each other. To talk to each other. To listen to each other. To begin to, to create a place of understanding between each other. One of my favorite old movies of the past, starring Paul Newman, and my daughters have heard this over and over again, Cool Hand Luke, what we have here is a failure to communicate. I love that line. And we do. We have a failure to communicate. God has a failure to communicate because we are not willing to listen. Sometimes we are not able, able to listen. 
because the fears have taken hold and they dominate our day-to-day living. But there is a way out. And it is in Christ Jesus. And we can do this, you and I. You can do this. Turn back briefly to a moment in time with Jacob and Esau. Genesis, early part. But particularly Genesis chapter 33, verse 10. Remember the story of Jacob and Esau, the brothers? Jacob stole the birthright of Esau. Do you remember that story? How terrible it was. Stealing from your own brother. Irreconcilable differences between Jacob and Esau. They took opposite sides and they hated each other for a long, long time. They suspected each other of great crimes and with good reason. Jacob had lied and taken the birthright of Esau when Isaac blessed what was supposed to be Esau's blessing but became Jacob's. The battle, the dissension, the lies and the betrayal went on and on and on. And we understand this, don't we? We do. And yet, in chapter 33, verse 10, it comes to this point. Jacob and Esau unite. Jacob sees Esau coming. At first he is suspicious and doesn't understand what's going on. But in verse 10 he says this. To see your face is like seeing the face of God. To see your face is like seeing the face of God. This is an amazing moment in Scripture. This is an amazing moment in life itself. Jacob and Esau, who had lied and betrayed each other, had found a place of reconciliation and hope. Our gospel today is centered at a place of Caesarea Philippi. The God of this world has dominion over the people. And Jesus comes. Ask the disciples, ask the people, who do people say that I am? And then he asks them, who do you say that I am? Following Jesus is not trendy. I'm sorry, it's not. Following Jesus is not going to be easy. It never has been. It was never meant to be easy. The world sees the cross as a weird and strange and grotesque thing. Sometimes we do. It's not a marketing strategy that Jesus came up with. It's not a, it's not a marketing design that God came up with. It is life. Jesus is not going to fit our profile of what we want. God, the Messiah, is his own profile. We need to understand it. We need to understand Christ Jesus. You need to ask yourself, who is Jesus? Who do you say? He is.